I'm Gisela Nelson, this is my husband Paul Nelson, and um, quite a few years ago we did the 40 day fast and we prayed for our purpose and our mission. And you guys have been on that journey with us because we stood up here and we talked about the new legacy reentry corporation that we that God gave us to put together. And it's been a struggle over the years. As of tomorrow, we have our first resident coming from um, Dismiss Charities. And we also have, uh, what is it, uh, Spalding University, who has connected themselves with us and they are running all of their, their programs out of our facility. And <laughs> it's just been one thing after another. And God has been so good, and I'm, we, we just, this, this was it. You know, this God gave us everything we asked for and more. And I want to say it's really a first-class facility, and congratulations. Hallelujah. God bless you. Let's give him a great big hand. My name is Pamela Colvin. Um, I don't know if anybody was here when I gave my testimony in the end of 2013 about the house that my husband and I got. But it had to do with when we were opening up the radio station, the Lord spoke to me to give $270. Well, last year, the beginning of uh, January, I told my husband, when we pay our tithes, we're going to give with a 27, those two numbers. If the Lord calls us to give $200, we're going to give 227 If He calls us to give $1,000, we'll give $1,000, $27. we done it all year. I mean, if the Lord spoke to me, I would make it... 27 something 27 well I'd been praying to quit my job and I quit my job one month before I was there seven years I started my new job on May 2nd comes the seven well I'm a real estate agent first house I get July something like 27 I'm like okay this is good second house two hundred seventy thousand dollars I go home and tell my husband I said oh my gosh you ain't gonna believe this I get a, another commission check, $2,700. I said, oh, that's God. You can't say that's not God. So then something else happens. So anyway, I get this other guy. He's an investor. I'm selling his houses for him. He starts coming to my house in the mornings. I'm going to make it fast. And, um, and we get to be friends. And this house I was selling, I mean, it was, we had every single problem you could think of. So I said, listen, we're going to sell this house. God will make a way. I said, you know, it's kind of a joke with me and my family, but if I pray for something, it'll happen. I said, we'll sell his house. So he's like, okay. So we sold it. Well, he called me two weeks ago, and that the night before I told my husband, I said, Jamie, you know, don't worry about money. I feel like you're, you know, worried about it. I said, I know God's going to bless us. Experience the worship, be changed by the ministry, and feel the presence of God. Don't miss any of the special fasting services at Evangel this January. For more information, visit worldprayercenter.org or like us on Facebook. Hallelujah. I want you to take your Bible and hold it up to the Lord. If you don't have a Bible, hold your hand up to the Lord. But I want everyone to make this declaration with me. Say, this is the Word of God. This is God's plan for my life. It's a light into my pathway. It's a lamp into my feet. This is my road map. This year, as I read the Word of God, God will speak to me. Every promise in this book belongs to me and my children, and my grandchildren. Whatever the devil says is a lie, and God will do the opposite. Because I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do, and I can be what it says I can be. In Jesus' name. As you remain standing, please turn with me to the book of Joel. Joel chapter 2, and I want to begin reading in verse 28. Joel 2, 28. Would you say that please? Joel 2, 28. 
many believe the prophet Joel will, was actually the son of the widow woman who gave the cake to Elijah. Uh, Jewish theologians, they claim that he was the boy who grew and became a great prophet. And here in the, the 28th verse, it says, And it will come to pass afterwards that I'll pour my spirit out on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your own men will dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. And that word is timnerah, which means mushroom-shaped clouds or atomic clouds. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord. As you remain standing, please turn with me now to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2, beginning in the 16th verse. It says, And this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And he goes on to say that I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And in verse 19, and I will show wonders in heavens above and signs in the earth beneath. In verse 20, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord comes. The difference in these scriptures as he quoted it, it was Joel that said before the terrible day of the Lord. Because he saw the judgments that were coming upon the earth. But Peter said before the notable or the awesome day of the Lord. Because he saw what would happen for God's people. That where the devil would bring defeat, Jesus would bring victory. And it was a sign the Lord's return was at hand. And then I want you to look with me over in the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 24 and in the 29th verse, Matthew 24, 29. And Jesus talks about events that will take place before he returns. And in verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Father, anoint your word with great power. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen, and you may be seated. God bless you. Pastors all over this nation are preaching today on the great events that are going to take place in 2015. They want to give some type of word that will encourage people uh, for this coming year. What I want to share today is why you should fast 21 days in 2015. And if you have made plans not to fast, or you don't want to participate, I want you to put your mind in neutral just for a moment, because I want to share with you a few things. The Bible talks about the four blood moons. The four blood moons is an amazing um, phenomena, because if you go to the NASA website, and they go back to 1999 BC, 2000 years before Christ, and they project to the year 3000, that's a thousand years from now, about solar eclipses. They say there will be 12,064 lunar eclipse. That, and of that, 3,479 will be total eclipse. But a phenomena that takes place is what is called a lunar terad, or there are four lunar eclipses in a row. Now, that is something you can just see out of 3,3500 ,3, total eclipses, then to have four in a row would be a phenomena that would take place over 5,000 years. But when it would happen on a Jewish feast day, on the Passover or on Feast of Tabernacles, which are two of the, some of the most important feast days in the Jewish calendar, for that to happen, even one of these to take place, is a mathematical statistic of one 
times 100 times 100 times 100 in 100 million days. Or in other words, it's a number that doesn't even exist. But it is so unbelievable that it would happen even one time. But yet, we are now in the midst of our eighth blood moon that has taken place on a Jewish feast day since the time of Christ. Over the next blood moon that would take place on a Jewish feast day is 600 years from now. So Jesus gave this, that the moon would turn to blood or there would be a lunar eclipse. It would happen on these Jewish feast days. And he gave this as one of the great prophetic events that would take place just before he came back. So this is a major signal. It's a major signal that we're living in the very end of the last days. So to give you an idea of what we're talking about, on April the 15th, this past year, there was a lunar eclipse, and then it was on the Passover. Then on April the 4th, there will be another eclipse this coming year that will take place on the Passover. And then on October the 8th of this past year, on the Feast of Tabernacles, there was a lunar eclipse. And the next one will be September 28th of 2015. At the end of January is the halfway mark. The halfway mark of this four blood moons. So we're right in the middle of it. And Jesus said that when these, you see these tribulations happen. Now what is tribulations? These ca catastrophes that are happening upon the world. You look what's happened in the Ukraine. There have been 4,000 Russian soldiers killed. There have been over 1,000 uh, that have been um, of the Ukrainians that have died. You look at the Ebola outbreak. There have been 4,500 that have died in that. In the Palestinian and Israeli war that took place for 50 days this past summer, there were 2,100 Palestinians that died, including 500 children and 64 Israelis. The ISIS and Boko Haram, which is down in Nigeria, have almost had equal amounts of killings the ISIS have killed 10,700, and most of those Christians and some crucified on crosses, even children crucified, nailed to pieces of wood. The Boko Haram has killed 10,340, have been destroyed by them. And then the plane crashes. It's, this is a phenomena and it's happening in just one part of the world which is a dominant strong Muslim area of the world there was the flight Malaysian Air 370 227 people disappeared there was the Malaysian flight 17 shot down by the by the Russians 298 were killed and then the Air Asia coming into Kuala Lumpur. It uh, crashed this week, 162 people destroyed. Then you're seeing the lawlessness here in America, a rise in anti-Semitism, a rise of racism, anti-police. Uh, I mean, it almost wants to put our country back into the wild, wild west. And we're living, and we've now just reached the halfway point. And so we talk about this year. And to even make this a little more complicated, this is the year of the Shemitah. If you'll read in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 15, verse 1, it talks about the year of the release. And it was a seven-year cycle. Every seven years, there would be a release of debt if you... People owed you money, that would be forgiven if they were Jewish. If you had land, you'd kind of backed off. You didn't plow the land. You just sat back. You let God begin to speak to you. The synagogues became packed with people, and it was a spiritual reset button.
But if a person did not honor the Shemitah, if they did not participate in this, it was almost like a curse came on them. And our country has so been uh, intertwined with Israel, and one of the reasons God allowed America to be created was to help birth the nation of Israel. And when our country began to turn back on God, on this seven-year cycle of the year of the Shemitah, something happened to our country. We began to have major, major recessions. And as you go back, even to the Great Depression, it happened on a Shemitah year. Over the past 40 years, the greatest times of recession that have occurred where property values have dropped, where the stock market has dropped, has happened on this seven-year cycle. It happened in 73, it happened in 80, it happened in 87, it happened in 2001 with 9-11. Seven years later, it happened in 2008 where the stock market on one day plunged greater than it had ever plunged before. Seven, seven, seven point seven points. And now this is the year of the Shemitah again. So what are we looking at? Well, it doesn't matter if you're a Christian economist or not. People are saying this is the year the dollar's gonna die. There's gonna be a catastrophe that takes place, they're saying. You're talking about people who have their PhDs in economy, and uh, they study these things. They're saying, we have reached a cycle, and this may be the end of the leadership of the United States in the world economically. I don't know what's going to happen, but God does. And God is revealing in his word these patterns to us. And we have to be like the Berean church who studied the word of God to get direction on what to do. Miracles that young people and children say there's a God and I want to follow God. I want to be preachers. More miracles, more signs and wonders, more empowerful, special miracles than in any other generation. And we're that generation in the name of Jesus. Be a part of the 2015 Fasting Movement with Dr. Bob Rogers. Visit My21DayFast.com for updates, fasting materials, and other resources. My21DayFast.com is your source for information on fasting and prayer in 2015. Experience the worship, be changed by the ministry, and feel the presence of God. Don't miss any of the special fasting services at Evangel this January. For more information, visit worldprayercenter.org or like us on Facebook. Actually, if you have a Catholic Bible, it says a green horse. And green is the color of Islam. Every Islamic nation, Iraq, Iran, Egypt, Jordan, all of these countries, Saudi Arabia, they have green as the dominant color in their flag. It's the color of Islam. If you go down to River Road, there's a mosque down there. At night, it's lit with green lights. It is the color of Islam and shows the rise of the Islamic um, agenda to take over the world. And so we're living right in the midst of all this. We're seeing it right before our eyes. 
And many times it's kind of hard to swallow that that really is this generation. But it is. So you say, Pastor, what should we do? Well, this is one of the reasons we're fasting. We're fasting because in every situation where there has been, been uh, the time of God's destruction upon a land, God has always taken care of his people. When the flood came, Noah and his family were high and dry, and they were eating T-bone steaks. Hallelujah. I know they came in two by two and the clean animals seven by seven, but I just have a feeling that God sent a couple extra steers in there just to take care of Noah. And then uh, in the time when the destruction came to the city of Jerusalem, Jesus prophesied that the day would come when there would not be a stone unturned upon the temple mount. They laughed at him. And he says, when, the, when you see the hills surrounded, he said, flee to the mountains, for your redemption is in the mountains. So in 70 AD, General Titus and the Roman legions, they surrounded, they surrounded Jerusalem, and it was during the time of Passover. There were Jews that came from all over the world. They had come from Greece. They had come from Turkey. They had come from Syria. There were over a million Jews in the city of Jerusalem. And now the Roman legions had surrounded them. And the Christians remembered that God said the city would be destroyed and they were to flee. But how could they flee? The city was surrounded. And so God sent a message. And that message came to General Titus. It was from Rome that there was insurrection in Rome and they were to bring their troops to Caesarea to possibly come back to Rome to help defend the capital. And so he withdrew his troops and then word came when they got into Caesarea that everything had been resolved and they were go back and capture Jerusalem. But while they were gone, the Christians, they said, it's time for us to flee. Jesus said the time had come. The rest of the Jews said, no, God's given us victory over the Romans. They'll never come back. But there was not one Christian that died when Titus came and he destroyed Jerusalem because they had followed the words of Christ. And so the Lord is going to protect us. And the Bible says when you see all these things begin to come upon you, rejoice and be exceedingly glad because your redemption draweth nigh. Hallelujah. I believe this is the year of rejoicing. This is the year of victory in the name of Jesus Christ. And I want to share with you four things that I want you to do this year. I want you to write them down. If you don't uh, have any paper, write them down on your arm. Everybody else tattoos themselves. Why don't you tattoo yourself with the word of God? Hallelujah. Number one. I want you to declare every day, this is a day of victory. This is a day that we will win this day. Say it with me. We will win this day. <coughs> I want you to get up in the morning. I want you to prophesy to yourself, this is a day of victory. You don't have to worry about tomorrow. You don't have to worry what's going to happen next week. Just give me this day our daily bread. And Jesus will bring you through victorious in the name of the Lord. I got up this morning. I began to prophesy to myself. I had an angel come and wake me up at 3.33. I was so tired. I said, God, can I, I, I don't think I can get up. And I got up and went in there and prayed. And the glory of God came on me. I still feel it in my bones right now. Hallelujah. And the Lord began to speak to me. God began to talk to me this morning. I finally went back to bed about 30 minutes later. And I tell you, in the name of Jesus, I began to declare that today was a day God had declared for me. This is my day. I'm going to be victorious today. I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I know I've got the devil by his tail right now. And I'm squeezing in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. So declare victory and win your day. The second thing that you must believe God is that God's going to bless you. You're going to prosper. I don't care what happens to the economy. God's going to give you direction in the name of Jesus. In the times of Joseph, Joseph interpreted the dream of Pharaoh. He said, you're going to have seven good years and seven bad years. 
He said, save during the good times and uh, you will prosper during the bad times. And they prospered during those seven good years. But when the bad years came, they prospered even greater. Do you believe God can cause you to be blessed greater when the economy's down than when it's up in the name of the Lord? I believe the Holy Spirit can speak to you and direct you and guide you. I was fasting and the Lord spoke to me on, on these, this early year fast as we do and God told me to sell a piece of rental property I had. It was the most prosperous property that I owned. I made more money off that property than any other property I had. And God said to sell it. I said, I don't want to sell that property. It's a, it's a blessing to me. And the Lord said, you sell it. And so I put it up for sale and a buyer came and bought that property. And then right after that, things totally changed in that area. And that property values began to drop and drop and drop. But God has spoken to me. And I came out blessed in the name of Jesus. God can bless you even in a down time. When the bad times came, Joseph began to buy property. And they absolutely began to increase and increase and increase. Years ago, I was invited to come to Bismarck, North Dakota. And there a pastor who lived down in Lemon, South Dakota met me. And he drove me that two-hour stretch. That's where the Sioux Indian nation is. That's where Sitting Bull was killed. I met the chief. The chief was, was the great-great-grandson of the brother to Sitting Bull, and his claim to fame was that brother that he had killed uh, Custer. And he had become a Christian, this great-great-grandson. And uh, uh, so... It had not rained there for three years. And they had read my book on the 21-day fast, and they said, Pastor Bob, do you believe if we fasted that it would rain here in Lemon? They took me out and showed me the, res the a reservoir, the water reservoir. It was a lake. It was a small lake. It had a dam that had been built, and you could actually see the foundation of the dam. The water level was so low, it looked like a pond at a farmer that would be dried up. That's what it looked like. They said, if it doesn't rain this year, our town's going to close up. There's going to be bankruptcies in this whole part of South Dakota. What should we do? I said, well, I think you ought to get every church together, the leadership, and call a day of fasting. And on that, fast at least until the evening time. Have a service and repent of your sins. Ask God to heal your land. And so that night, it sprinkled. It, it rained. And the next morning, I met with him again. I said, that's a sign to you that God is going to heal South Dakota. So what happened was uh, they called a national or, or a day of prayer. The Catholic Church, the Lutheran Church, the Methodist, the Church of God, the Sioux Indians, they came together. And they prayed. Three weeks later, it began to rain. And it rained, and it rained, and it rained. It rained for a week. It filled up the, the reservoir. The reservoir was at the very top level. Some had said they had never seen it filled that high before. They sent me a newspaper towards August. And they had had the largest crop that any people had remembered. They had the silos totally filled with grain, with wheat. And then there were piles of, of, of the wheat that went almost as high as the top of those silos. What was it? It was God blessed them, and God healed their land, and God will bless you even in a time of famine for the glory of God. Can I hear an amen? Hallelujah. And then I want you to believe God for revival to come. Say revival in my family. The Bible says, and it will come to pass afterwards that I'll pour my spirit out on all flesh. 
Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. For your son and daughter to prophesy means they get off of drugs. It means they get out of their promiscuous lifestyle. It means they turn their lives to God. It means they get filled with the Holy Ghost. It means they have their soul winners. They cast out devils. They heal the sick. It means revivals come into your house in the name of Jesus. I want you to proclaim it. I want you to believe it. I want you to, to speak it with your mouth. This is my year. It's been a number of years ago, probably 30 years ago, I was preaching up in Ohio in a revival, and God put on me a spirit of watching and prayer. A watching in the Bible, and you read about it in 2 Corinthians, is where people have all-night prayer meetings. Uh, Paul said, I was often in watchings, that he prayed all night. And I did not sleep for three days. And during that time, I prayed, and God began to speak to me and showed me different places I would go to. He showed me I would go to South Bend, and I would preach at Notre Dame University. I didn't know anybody. I, I knew no one in South Bend. And I heard of Brother Lester Summerall, who was a quite a notable man of God, and I thought, well, he might know of a church that I might fit in. I know he wouldn't have me. And I called that church, and he answered the phone. I called in the morning. The secretary wasn't there. He answered the telephone, and I told him that I had been in prayer for three days, and God told me I would come to South Bend, and I would preach, and, and does he know a church I might fit in? He said, yeah, this church. I want you to come and preach here. I went there, and I preached for a three-day revival that turned in to be over a month. He told me, he said, this is the greatest revival I've ever had in our church. I've had Brother Copeland, I've had Brother Hagen for one night, but this is the greatest revival I ever had. God sent me to Iowa. He told me I would go to Iowa. And every place that we went and had these extended meetings, they'd have to build a new church. It was just an awesome outpouring. And the Lord spoke to me, you'll go to North Dakota. Well, I, I didn't know, about it, know anyone in North Dakota. And finally, I got the name of a minister I called, and they didn't want me. And so I just kind of put that on the shelf. And about 10 years ago, I got a phone call, and it was from a pastor in North Dakota. He pastored a small church. It was in a small town, and I, I told him I would come. And when I got there, he had had a vision and in that vision, he had seen come to get me at the airport. And in that airport, he said, I came out and I, I was huge. I was tall. And I was ducking under the, the doorway. I had to move to keep from hitting the lights. And he said that God spoke to him that, that he was bringing someone that would have an influence that would touch the state of North Dakota. So he invited all these pastors. Pastors came, probably 30 or 40 pastors came to that little church. And I preached on prayer and fasting. I laid hands on the people and I imparted to them an anointing to fast. And they went back and they started fasting in North Dakota. Well, I went there uh, yesterday. Actually, Friday, I went and preached there. It was 15 below zero when I got off the plane. It was blowing snow. And when I came back yesterday, I had a five hour layover in Minneapolis. And so I'm, I'm waiting on the flight and there was a lady and I began to talk to her. And we began to talk about God and I said, well, uh, we're entering into our 21 day fast and I've started my fast early. She said, oh really? She said, our church is fasting. We're fasting 21 days. And she was from North Dakota, uh, and I said, well, what church do you go to? She says, uh, I go to a Methodist church. And I said, well, I never heard of a Methodist church fasting 21 days. She said, well, there was some fellow that comes up here to North Dakota, and they got talking about fasting, and somehow it just, it just has spread. And I thought to myself how God used that obedience unto him to help ignite a revival that's taking place in the Dakotas. I remember the first time I went to that church, I stood and it was a poor church. 
It was uh, just working people. They were farming farmers. And I began to prophesy over every one of those men that God was going to bless them, that God was going to raise up millionaires, that God was going to uh, uh, do supernatural things for them financially. Did you know every one of those farmers, they hit oil on their property. The oil boom came there to North Dakota. And when you look today, the most prosperous state and the state that has the least unemployment is the Dakotas in the name of the Lord. I'm here to tell you God's in the business of taking off of you what the devil put on you and then putting back on you what the devil took off of you. If you believe that, say amen. Hallelujah. So I want you to get up and I want you to declare every day, this is a day that I will win. This is a victorious day. I'm going to win this day. I want you to believe that God's going to prosper you. You have power in the name of Jesus to make money. God's given you that power in the name of the Lord. I've released that power to you through the, through the word of the Lord. Thirdly, I want you to believe for your family to be saved. And fourthly, I want you to believe for miracles, signs, and wonders in Jesus' name. Do you know the reason that I'm a preacher? It's not because my daddy was a preacher. That may be a part of it. I learned a lot growing up in the home of a preacher. But I'm a preacher because I saw the miracles of God. When I was in high school, I broke my arm playing football. I broke the socket off my arm. I broke it again below that, and my arm quit growing. I was in the hospital 45 days in traction. And my arm began to turn black. I had one of those withered arms. And a preacher came to my hospital room. His name was Bob Boos. He had been a Baptist preacher and got the baptism in the Holy Ghost. And he came in and laid hands on me and said, this is the work of the devil. And God sent me here that you might be healed. And God healed my arm. God healed my arm where I was destined to have a withered arm. God healed me in the name of Jesus. I've never doubted that. I've never failed to believe that God would not heal and God would not, not make you whole. And when God called me to preach, I felt like I was destined to see miracles and miracles of healing and signs and wonders in the name of the Lord. In our first service today, a lady sat on the front row. She's been a part of this church for over 20 years. She had a pacemaker put here in, in her uh, chest. And she was in a service, and I don't know if some of you were part of that service, but that preacher got up that night and said, God is going to remove metal and dissolve metal in people's bodies. There were people that night that had steel bars in their back through surgery. They were as stiff as a board, and they were reaching down and touching their toes. You could not feel the metal. Well, Joyce... Joyce had that pacemaker, and she came forward, and she said, I cannot feel my pacemaker. And so a nurse went in the back. She examined her and said, we couldn't feel it either. She went to her doctor. They x-rayed her. There was no pacemaker in her body. Now, how many know that kind of makes you wonder? Well, that's what a sign and a wonder is. It'll make you wonder. And I'm here to tell you, God does things that'll make you wonder. There was a lady who went home, and that night her sheets turned purple, where the titanium rods that were put in her body evidently dissolved because she was totally able to, to move freely in her back, totally made whole in Jesus' name where we're living in a time for signs and wonders and miracles in the name of Jesus. <clears throat> now, what happens if you are diagnosed with cancer? What should you do? Well, number one, you uh, have to shake off the fear. Because when somebody says cancer, you think, how long do you have? And all of that is fear, and the fear is worse than the cancer itself. You have nothing to be afraid of. But you need to get a good doctor. 
Thank God for doctors. But doctors don't have all the answers. They can do all they can, but Jesus is the healer. And you need to do everything in your power to try to get well. You need to eat right. If you smoke or have bad habits, you need to stop it. Stop it now. God will help you to stop it. If you're overweight, get yourself in shape. For crying out loud, a 21-day fast will help you in the name of Jesus. You'll feel better. You'll look better. You'll look younger. Ooh. It'll make mama look, look better. Hallelujah. So, but you need to pray. You need to trust God. You need to believe God for the miracles of the Holy Spirit to come and heal you and to restore you in Jesus' name. Oh, hallelujah. I had a, a young girl in our church when I was a single pastor. And we would go out on Saturday and we would go to the neighborhood and we would invite people. And uh, a lady would meet me there every Saturday morning. Her name was Dealey Walls. And we would meet back about noon, and she came back, and she said, Pastor Bob, I, I met a family. They've never been to church. Their kids have never been to church. They've got four kids. They're going to send them tomorrow. They're the Kraft family, and they've got a little girl, Gidget. She's five. She doesn't hear. And uh, the Lord told me God was going to heal her. And so the next Sunday, there was um, three of those children were there, the older ones. Gidget didn't come. I sat on the front row and got into a fight on the front row. I went down there and straightened them out, set one over here. Had an old sister in our church. I set her on the front row between them. But when I gave the altar call, they came to the altar. They got saved. They started coming every Sunday. And one of the little boys said, Brother Bob, when I grow up, I want to be a preacher just like you. And then we were baptizing. And they... Their parents came that Sunday night as we baptized. And when I got there to church, Sister Wall said, uh, Pastor Bob says uh, they brought Gidget. Gidget's here. And I know God's going to heal her. And so I said, would you pray for her? And I, and I said, all right. And I, before uh, the water baptism, I took little Gidget and I held her in my hand, in my arms. Gidget was five years old. On Mondays, they would take her to the Kentucky School for the Deaf. It was down in Danville. They would drive her down there. She would stay all week. They'd pick her up on Friday. That's kind of traumatic for a five-year-old. She wore a strap across her that had a large hearing aid. It looked like a transistor radio that had these, these plugs that came up to her ears, and she couldn't talk plain. She would sign... And I prayed for her that God would heal her. I rebuked the demons off of her life. Well, the next day on Monday, they drove her to Danville very early. And about 10 o'clock, I had a phone call from Miss Kraft. And she said, Pastor Bob, she said, uh, I just got a call from Danville. And we brought little Gidget today. She was there by 8 o'clock. And they were doing some testing. And they said she doesn't have a hearing problem, said she, she can hear totally. And God had totally healed that little girl. She, uh, the next year they enrolled her in the first grade in the Fayette County uh, school system. God healed her, and God will heal you, and God will do anything but fail in the name of Jesus. When you read the book of, of Matthew chapter 6, there are the three duties of every believer. You have a duty to give. It says when you give. It says don't be like the hypocrites who give to be seen of men. For they have their reward. Say reward. But give unto God. And the Bible says it not to be seen of men. And the Father who seeth in secret will reward you openly. And then it says when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who stand to be heard of their prayers. But when you pray, enter into your closet. And when you shut the door, Pray to the Father which seeth in secret, and the Father shall reward you openly. And then it says, when you fast, it says, don't uh, look gloomy and appear unto men to fast, but wash your face, anoint, your, anoint with oil, and the Father who sees in secret 
will reward you openly. Those who fast to be seen of men, they have their reward. But you shall be rewarded of God. Now those are completely two different words. There are six times reward is used in that, 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 uh, those scriptures. But the rewards by man is a different Greek word than the reward that will be given by God. The reward by man is the reward that you get and it's a one-time gift. It's like you have a, a punching in and, and you get paid by the hour. You get paid $10 an hour, you work your time, you get your pay. That's your reward by man. But the reward by God is a residual reward. It's like owning some rental property and having it paid for. And every month, you get a check in the mail. Say, check in the mail. God wants to send you checks in the mail every month this year. And that's what happens when you fast. You get blessed in May because what you did in January. You get blessed in June because you honored God during this 21 days of fasting. Your kids get scholarships the following year because you were obedient to God in this time of fasting. It's a residual. It, it's every month the check is automatically deposited in your account in the name of Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. amen. In the book of Psalms 141 verse 2. Say that with me. Psalms 141. Say Psalms 141. Verse 2 is my favorite scripture. That's pretty pitiful. Uh, hallelujah. It says, let my prayer be set before thee as incense and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Let my prayer be set before you as incense. When the sacrifice was brought to the temple, sometimes there were 10,000 sacrifices. 10,000 lambs, pigeons. And the priest would have to sacrifice that. They'd have to clean the blood. They'd have to pull the carcasses out. You talk about a stench. You talk about something that would make you gag. You talk about just getting close to that. It's like going close to the garbage dump. And so what they would do was they had a very strong incense. It was kind of a musk odor. I've smelled it. And the priest would come and over every sacrifice, he would, he would pour this incense. So it was something that you could tolerate. It actually smelled good. And God says that this represents the stench of the earth. It represents the sacrifice for our sins, for our sickness, for our poverty. And our prayers must rise up and be stronger than sickness. And must be stronger than the curse that would come upon our families. And as we would pray, our prayers would rise up as the incense and would overcome the devil, would overcome the attacks on our families. And then it says that our, our lifting of our hands would be as the evening sacrifice. These sacrifices they brought we're not just the runt of the flock. They wouldn't go out there and say, well, listen, I can get a lot of money for, more money for these. these. These are better. Let's get one of these skinny ones. Doesn't look like he's going to make it through the winter anyway. No, they would, get, they would get the prize. They would get the best. The, the, the Bible taught that they had to be perfect. And eventually the Sanhedrin passed down a rule that you even checked their eyelashes to make sure they were healthy. So they groomed them. They became the pet. Come on, I know it's cold out there. Let's get the sacrifice lamb inside here. They washed him. They, they permed its hair. They, they petted it. They pampered it. They fed it corn. They fattened it up. And so when they, when they brought the lamb the lamb was such a pet, it could do tricks. It could set up. It could roll over. It was like your pet animal. And they brought it to God. And they said, let the lifting of your hands, let the, 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 the sacrifice of your efforts, 
Let a 21-day fast be as the evening sacrifice. It's an effort that you put out. It is something that you give to God. But God said he would honor it and he would bless it. What am I saying today? I'm saying this is a time that God's calling us to fast. It says when you fast. When do you fast? Well, you fast when a death comes to your family. You fast that if they died through cancer or diabetes, after that funeral is over, you fast to break that curse off your family. When do you fast? You fast at the beginning of the year like we're doing now on this 21-day fast. It sets, it sets the pattern of your year. It prepares you now for what's going to happen in the days ahead. I don't know what's going to happen, but whatever does happen, I'm going to come out on top in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah to the Lord. How many need a miracle in your life? Can I see your hand? Well, this is an opportunity for God to release a miracle. If you will join us in this time of fasting and prayer, I want you to stand to your feet right now. I want you to stand. I want you to believe God with me. I want you to come down here to the front right now because I want to release miracles. If you're here and say, Pastor, I cannot fast a total 21-day fast, but I can fast something. Well, you come down here too. Everybody can fast something. I went and preached at a, a, a church and they had a pastor on staff who played for the Cleveland Browns. He was an All-American at LSU and ended up playing for the Cleveland Browns and he got cancer. He got cancer in his rectum and then it metastasized and got into his lung. He went on a 21-day fast and he asked God to heal him. He uh, heard that cancer cannot live in raw milk. You can't buy raw milk. It has to be pasteurized and homogenous. And uh, he, you can't even buy it. So he found a, a farmer. And this farmer said, well, I'll give you all the raw milk you can drink. And he started drinking that milk a gallon a day. Last week, the fact is they called me. He went to the bathroom and he passed this huge tumor of cancer. It passed right through his, into the stool. He had gone to the doctors. He had done everything the doctor said. But I'm here to tell you, Jesus is your deliverer. And Jesus can bring a great miracle in your life. How many need a miracle in your family? Hold your hand up. How many need a miracle in your finances? Hold your hand up. How about in your physical body? How many need God to touch you? Well, this is what we're talking about in Jesus' name. I want you to lay your hands right here on your body. In the name of Jesus, I curse. I curse cancer. I curse generational sicknesses. I curse the diseases that killed your father and your mother and your aunts and your brothers. I curse it and declare it will not come on you in the name of Jesus Christ. I declare you shall live to be a good old age and you shall still bear fruit in your old age and you shall be fat and flourishing for God in Jesus' name. I come against diabetes and high blood pressure and Alzheimer's disease. I rebuke it from your body for the glory of God. Lift up your right hand. I declare prosperity to come into your house. You will not be poor. You know, will not be with, without. But God shall open the windows of heaven. He will give you opportunities. He will promote you. He will bless you. He will strengthen you in Jesus' name for the glory of God. I want you now to put both hands over your heart. I pray for your family today. I pray that your children will rise up and be mighty in the name of the Lord. I break abuses and drug addictions and attacks upon their life. I bind divorce. It will not happen in your home in the name of Jesus. I declare your family shall rise up. They shall achieve more than you have achieved. They'll be worth more than you're worth. 
they'll accomplish more than you've ever been able to accomplish. I break every curse off of you. I break it off your children in the name of Jesus. They'll marry the right companion. They'll accomplish great things. God shall use them for the glory of God. They'll be filled with the Holy Ghost. They shall be called into the ministry. They shall do exploits in the name of Jesus Christ. I want you to reach over and join the hands of people on either side of you. If you don't know their name, I want you to ask their, them their name. It may be a family member, but it may be someone you don't know. Now I want you to begin to pray for them. And I want you to speak their name. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray for one another today. I break off of you in Jesus' name. Discouragement and an attitude of defeat and an attitude of lack. I break it off of you in Jesus' name. I declare you're victorious for the glory of God. <coughs> you will win this day. You will be victorious in Jesus' name. I declare that God is meeting you. God is helping you. God is directing you. God's giving you direction and by the Holy Spirit in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now I want you to pray this prayer with me. Say, Father God, next to loving you, I love the people of God. I'm not mad at anybody. I release those people to you. I forgive those who've done me wrong. Those who owe me money and haven't paid me. I forgive them in Jesus' name. Cause money to come from other sources. Father, bless those on either side of me. May they be encouraged. Lord, we don't know what this year holds, but we know that you hold this year. And you hold my life in your hands. Speak to my life. Direct my life for your glory and for your honor. Now, Lord, during this time of fasting, I give you permission to wake me up at night. May I hear your voice. May you speak to me and direct me for the glory of God. Amen. How many meant that prayer? Hold your hand up. If you meant that prayer, let's give the Lord a great big praise clap. Hallelujah. 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 that young people and children say there's a God and I want to follow God. I want to be preachers. More miracles, more signs and wonders, more empowerful, special miracles than in any other generation. And we're that generation in the name of Jesus. Be a part of the 2015 fasting movement with Dr. Bob Rogers. Visit my21dayfast.com for updates, fasting materials, and other resources. my21dayfast.com is your source for information on fasting and prayer in 2015.